Professor Kari Syrjanen räägib peomarkerite paneeluuringutest maavähi riskigruppi selgitamisel, nii et tegelikult niisugune praktiline lähenemine. Juo, välkam. Good afternoon, everybody. On my behalf, I would like to thank the organizers for this nice opportunity to to organize this important session, which we feel is very pertinent today because gastric conditions and stomach problems are so common in, in general practice, so we just want to emphasize some of these key issues. And of course, my topic is, is to introduce a little bit more further the gastro panel test, which already you heard from Penti, so now you have had half an hour time to digest the information, so this should be more familiar to, to you now in this second uh, presentation. Usually we feel that repetition is useful and, and we hope that this applies here as well. So as you already learned, as the name implies, the panel of markers always indicates that you have more than one marker, so in this case we have four biomarkers, which Penti already explained. And everything, of course, is based on stomach physiology. And me as a pathologist, so I like to show you some, some histological pictures, so we know exactly from which type of cells in the mucosa these markers are derived from. And the fact is very important to realize that in this case, this is not the high values of the markers which are important, but it is the low values of the markers which are clinically more important. And that's very easy to understand, because if those cells disappear, which secrete the cells, then of course the marker disappears or marker levels decrease in the blood as well. So remember, not the high values in most of the cases, but the low values which are clinically more more relevant. So we have pepsinogenes 1 and 2, which are specific to st stomach corpus. And then we have uh, gastrin 17, which is one of the molecules of gastrin family of peptide hormones, which are numbered by their molecular weight, starting from higher molecular weight, like for 34 and so on. And there are some minor ones as shown here, gastric 14. But gastric 17 was selected as the marker of choice because it's the most active and most clinically relevant gastri of those gastrins. And in this immunohistochemical picture, you can nicely see that the marker is derived from the specific cells only in the antrum. That's why it's a marker of gastric antrum. And what these markers are doing is explained in this very simple semantic presentation. So there is a very intimate interplay between the uh, gastrins and the acid output, as Penti already explained. And this is the link. So we have G cells, gastrin secreting cells, which given gastri gastrin output, and this illustrates the blood vessel. So it goes through the blood, and then it reaches parietal cells, which in the corpus, as you know, are those cells which are uh, synthesizing uh, gastric acid. And these cells have a specific receptor for gastrin, so the gastrin reaches these cells and stimulates acid output. And another important cell type also found in corpus mucosa, it's called enterochromaffin-like cell, which also has a receptor for gastrin-17, as you saw. And what this does is it makes histamine output and histamine receptor exist in parietal cells. And now, as clinicians, you certainly know that you have histamine receptor blockers, which influence exactly at that point. When you use, instead of PPI, you can use H2 receptor blockers, and the argument is that they, they block the histamine stimulation, and that's why they decrease also acid output. But they are less effective than PPI, but anyway, they are, are highly, uh, very widely used. So Penti already explained this one too. So in 
in most of the things in the human body, as you remember, there must be a positive and negative regulation, because otherwise the system would not work. And this is the same case also in the stomach. You have positive feedback. So when you ingest protein or any eat, then you get stimulation in the antrum, which means output of G17, which goes up in the blood, and it stimulates, as I showed you, acid output in the, in the stomach. But what happens then? When you get certain critical value, when acid reaches the level which is considered enough, then the pH goes down, and then it elicits a negative stimulation to antrum, sending a signal that we don't need any more G17, and the end result is that G17 goes down. So everything is really based on stomach physiology. So the next question is where we need gastro panel because as clinical doctors you have several other measures how to examine patients with gastric complaints and there are two principal uses of the test and these are shown here. The first one is that instead of gastroscopy, systematic gastroscopy, you could use this as a first line diagnostic test for dyspeptic complaints and of course the other major use is that you can use this as a population-based screening for the risk groups of gastric cancer. Not the cancer itself, because this is not a cancer test, and this is very important to realize. So it is a test for a risk of cancer, which means that it belongs to the domain of primary prevention, not to the secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is early detection, and early detection of gastric cancer means that of course, it's a better than nothing, but it's still secondary when you can detect the risk groups. So by, because by that you can have measures how to prevent the development of cancer, not only to find the early lesions. So that's a big, big difference. And when we think how common are different gastric conditions in the clinical primary care practice, so this is a uh, summary slides so in <coughs> just distribution of these things and, but these are not important for today discussion so but this one is as you can see in the average clinical practice more than 10% of your patients come to see you just because they have complaints in their stomach or abdomen whatever and we call them dyspeptic symptoms which is uh, not a very good name, but it has been adopted in the general language. <clears throat> so dyspepsia really is, is not a specific symptom, so it's a complex of symptoms, a different type of symptoms, and it has been estimated that during one's lifetime about 20-40 percent of population can have some kind of dyspeptic complaints which means that we are speaking about very common disease. And the other, the main, most common findings before, uh, behind the dyspeptic symptoms are listed here. And I don't repeat what Penti already showed. And just, I think this is very easy, easy to, to recognize when you have such patients complaining uh, gastric complaints, then you must think about several different options. And then you must think, how can I clarify which is the cause behind these complaints? And the answer to help you in that is gastropanel. And just a few words about the, the two main uh, indications so that was the dyspeptic complaints and then coming back to the gastric cancer risk factor screening and <clears throat> uh, as you know this is a disease with very unequal distribution globally so there are countries with very high risk of gastric cancer and there are some countries with very low risk but still comparing for example Sweden and Finland you can see that gastric cancer in Sweden is two times less prevalent, less incident than in Finland. 
uh, which certainly means that the disease has not been eradicated, or 40 years ago it was number one malignancy in both genders. Now it's, I will show the statistics soon. And when we speak about risk factors or odds ratios, when you speak about etiological and causal relationships, so if you only have helicobacter infection alone, without atrophy, then the odds ratio is something between 3 to the 13. But when you have atrophic gastritis, severe one, pancastritis, then it can be up to 90. And just to give you a perspective, everyone understands that smoking and lung cancer goes hand in hand. But actually the risk of smoking and lung cancer is only 12. Only 12. Okay, it's a high risk, but to, to think about this context, it's about the same order, but, uh, <coughs> but the risk of atrophic gastritis is much, much, certainly much, much more. And there are some other, other things which have even much higher, higher risk, but I, I don't discuss that further now. <coughs> and giving you some perspective, I, I just take data from Finland and also from Estonia, Globocan, where you can draw very nice statistics. And the advantage, for example, in Finland is that we have had cancer reg registry for more than 60 years by now, so we know exactly what was the situation in early 50s. And the blue line here shows very nicely that gastric cancer is declining dramatically, more deeply than any other cancer in our country. So compared with the situation 50 years ago when it was, there were more than 2,000 cases in our country, and now there are, there are only little more than 700 cases. But still, considering your country, I think ben, uh, Mikko already showed this, so these are the statistics showing that cancer, compared with your population, really, the cancer in Estonia is still much, much more incident than in Finland. And this is something what we had in, uh, let's say, late 70s or early 80s. So there's a big difference. So it is a big problem, no doubt. <clears throat> and we know now, sometimes simple things are, are very simple because Helicobacter pylori has been certainly definitely seen by by many other people than those who actually discovered it. We always, when I started specializing in pathology in Jorvi under Pentis guidance, so we, several times, we thought, oh, there's something, something in these biopsies. Penti always thought, ah, these are not important. They are normal, normal constituents of the gastric biopsies. Certainly now we know that these are, are helico, and if you do immunohistochemistry, you can nicely see that they are located both in the superficial epithelium and sometimes also and many times in the inside the glandular lumen. And this already I think Penti showed very nicely, so I don't repeat. The Correa cascade also we have have seen several times today and it is quite nicely established I think by Belaya Correa several decades ago and now we know that there are two types of, of sequence here we have so-called intestinal type of cancer, which really goes this way. But then there is another one which is diffuse type of gastric cancer, and that's why there is a question mark here, because there are some evidence that it can go or develop without these intermediate steps. So that when you detect atrophy, you know that this is on the way towards intestinal type of cancer, but sometimes diffuse type you can see without any, any atrophy in the biopsy. So we have two diseases. We have helicobacter pylori, we have atrophic gastritis, and we have two, two diagnoses, two diseases, but we have one diagnostic test, and we can ask the question why. And, and how we can do that. The first answer to the first question is, is very simple. Already Penti saw the same slide. So this is very important to make distinction, which is the uh, phenotype of gastritis. So whether it's antrum 
oriented or whether it is corpus oriented. And the issue here is that you have completely different risk for ulcer and you have completely different risk for, for uh, cancer. And the figure 90 comes here with the most severe forms of atrophic antrum gastritis and atrophic corpus gastritis together bring you at very, very high risk of. And then <coughs> the question, how? And the answer is very simple already. You know that. So we ha know that these markers are derived from specific cells of the stomach. These few immunohistochemical pictures illustrate it very nicely. And the change is you don't need to be pathologist to see that in this case you, th there is much, much more G17 cells than in, in this case where they are, ah, sorry, in, in this case and compared with, the, for example, this case which saw very, very few such cells in the atrophic antrum. And again, referring back to stomach physiology, now we speak about pathophysiology, which means an abnormal situation. And the situation comes different when you have atrophy in the corpus. So this one is the atrophy of corpus. So when you have a situation where you don't have the cells that produce acid output, then when you eat protein, you still get the same stimulation in the antrum as in normal situation, which means that G17 goes up, which means level in the serum goes up, but when it does not find any target in the mucosa, then there is really no, no response to uh, in acid output, which means that the G17 remains high in the serum sample, which means that whenever you detect high G17, there is a possibility that corpus is atrophic. And the other situation is that you have atrophy in the antrum, Okay, when you eat again, the same protein comes there. So it does not, because the G cells are missing, it cannot elicit any stimulation of G17, which means that G17 remains low. And one indication for that is that antrum is atrophic, because the cells are missing which produce G17, which means that the blood level of G17 remains normal despite the fact that corpus is completely normal. So this is one indication of low level of G17. The one possibility is antrum is atrophic. And gastro panel is really a laboratory test, one of the very few where you get verbal interpretation together with the test. When you ask a test, you can get the interpretation which is given by a gastro soft specific specifically designed software which interprets all the different possibilities what we can have. And the possibilities actually, they are not so complicated. There are only five main possibilities when you use this panel. Of course, the best situation is on the left where all the markers shown here, they are within normal limits. Then you can say that stomach is healthy no risk of stomach disease, and that's it. And, it. and certainly it makes the doctor happy and the patient happy because then, and it has very, very lo good negati uh, long-term uh, negative predictive value, which means that negative test predicts the situation many, many years ahead. So you don't need to repeat the test every year. So it is enough to do that maybe once in 10 years or so. The next possibility is that all the other markers are normal, the only helicobacter pylori antibodies are elevated, and of course in this case you have what we call really superficial gastritis without atrophy, or helico infection only, and then of course you can discuss together with patient whether to treat or not, but now the recommendation is that you should, should treat, treat the patient but because there is no atrophy, there is very little risk for, for cancer. And then the ne next three possibilities here <coughs> include that you have atrophy in the uh, corpus first, which shows here, and atrophy in the antrum, and then the last one is pan-atrophy, atrophy in both the antrum and corpus. 
And as you see here, these are absolute indications for gastroscopy because you need to have a confirmation of the diagnosis just to see what is the grade, grade of the uh, atrophy. So these are important. But, which means that you, this test, as Penti already showed, it uh, categorizes the patient into three different levels of risk. Healthy stomach, non-atrophic helicobacter infection, and atrophic gastritis. And certainly you should react accordingly now when you know what, what this implies clinically. And then the next question is how common when you do gastropanel test in the general population, what is the proportion of these different, different options? And of course, the answer depends on what very much if you examine patients who are younger, usually 45, let's say 50, can be used as a limit as well, or those who are older. Then, of course, the proportion in young women, uh, young patients, atrophy is, is really very rare, but already in people who are <coughs> more than 50, the atrophy increases. So this de answer depends on which type of population you examine. And this is very nicely illustrated also in another study, which Penti also referred to a study in, in northern Sweden, nicely demonstrate that the prevalence of atrophic gastritis significantly increases in parallel with the increasing age. So when you have really the three groups of risk, then you have three approaches of management, which is quite logical, I think. Healthy stomach, certainly you can be very happy. Nothing is needed. Helico, you can give eradication treatment for which there are different options whether seven days or 10 days. Okay, that depends on your, but I think most of the protocols now are based on seven day treatment. And of course the problem is the resistance strains, which still in, in Scandinavia and Nordic countries, they are not such a major problem as in, in many other countries. So this is just, just to illustrate you that this uh, test has been, the, mark, uh, the value of markers and helicobacter measurement have been validated very nicely in several major studies, long-term follow-up studies, for example, in Japan. This is one of those, just to illustrate that you can, using this very simple approach, helicobacter antibody and pepsinogen index, you can categorize patients into four categories of risk, which in the long-term follow-up gives you here the estimates of development of invasive cancer. So this is truly clinically really relevant. And the next one is, of course, as a laboratory, medicine always asks how this test, test performs, what are the sensitivity and specificity. And although this was not calculated in the original publication, which Penti also already referred, we can reproduce this type of calculation based on our data. So it shows really that using the pepsinogen one and the moderate to severe atrophy as a cutoff, you can really obtain a very beautiful rock curve. I think you don't really have very many tests which gives you such a nice, nice performance indicator. So it approaches almost the optimal one which there is no such test which gives you 1.0. This gives you 0 0.970, which is really fantastic performance. And almost equally well, if you use the cutoff P, the PG1, PG2 ratio for your calculation against the same cutoff, moderate to severe atrophy, then you, you get almost equally nice nice rock value, so you can say the test really performs optimally. And the last part of the work <coughs> presentation, I'm, I'm talking very briefly some of the issues related to health economy, because that is now the word of the day in many countries. People are asking, what does it cost? Is it more cost effective than the current practice? And we can really demonstrate now that 
this is very, very true. And I don't go in very much detail, but this is, this is what all information what we have, let's say, for six months ago, we used very simple calculation just to demonstrate, compare gastroscopy and gastro panel using the, the average cost estimates in the Finnish hospitals. So if you take the hypothetic population of 1,000 people, and if you do gastroscopy for everybody, then the cost is 400,000. And if you do the same using gastro panel, with the average uh, cost of 90 euro, you get an estimate of 90,000 cost. But if you do the third option, so you only made gastroscopy for those 40% or so, even less today, 40% of so, for whom it could be indicated, so then you, the cost would be 160,000, and when you deduct the cost, you can, even this very simple calculation can demonstrate that, that you can reduce the number of gastroscopies by replacing gastro panel, and the end result is a substantial cost saving. But today, certainly, this is not, not enough because everyone is speaking very sophisticated modeling, health economic models, so we decided to join the effort together with the leading Finnish company of experts, which is called Nordic Healthcare Group, which has this type of expertise. So we decided to model how much savings we can achieve using gastro panel instead of the current practice. And I really do not go into the details because this is a quite specific substance. So, but what we wanted to do is to to build up two different models. One is for the screening model, and the other one is for local municipals, because the politicians always ask, what are the savings in one year? So we wanted to build up something that we can show them how much we can save when we use Castro panel in one year. So <coughs> I skip this because but just to examine very, very briefly what the basic of all such modeling is that you must, the first step, you must model the whole situation by using so-called options, so nodes, and always you must think what is the situation after this, and also always you must have all these three different possibilities, and then you, again, the next, what happens next, and so on. So, this model contains more than 3,000 such, such nodes when you examine the whole procedure. What, what are the options when starting from the uh, situation where people have stomach complaints? What are the options? Anyway, and then it's important to include both the direct costs. And in many models, they only, you only include those. But equally important is to include also indirect costs, because sometimes they are equally high as, as direct costs, and, and we decided to do both that. And the end result is something like that. So this illustrates the situation in Finland, our population, and the hypothetic situation that someone makes a decision to screen one bird cohort, and this is optimized for the people age cohort of 50 year old, and screening once in a lifetime, and this model calculates what are the cost savings in the lifetime healthcare costs related to stomach disease. And you end up with a, a huge amount of 58 million euro in the level of Finland, just one single age group screened once by gastro panel compared with the current practice where you do gastroscopies and everything else. So this takes into account everything imaginable and non-imaginable. So this is just to illustrate that by using this simple test, you can achieve huge amount of cost savings. And of course, this model is adjustable so that in every country, you just need to know the costs of different measures and treatment modes, and then you can 
adapt this model to your local situation. That is your advantage. And Penti also showed these slides already. So now the international experts, panel of experts really a few years ago, published a very nice paper in Scandinavian Journal of Gastroenterology, where they uh, expressed their opinion what are the best uses of Castro panel, and uh, these recommendations really were very favorable to support Castro panel instead of gastroscopy. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Niin. Kysymykset. Mä näen yhtä kysymystä. Palun sinne mikrofon. I am Dr. Tarpito. I am working like a microbiologist. And uh, therefore, I should like to know uh, something about uh, the Helicobacter pylori. Uh, what is uh, the causa prima? What is uh, the first cause that uh, the Helicobacter pylori will just uh, grow there in, in the stomach? Is it uh, just uh, in such a way uh, that uh, just uh, the mucosa of the stomach is damaged? And then the microbe uh, will find there for a, for a comfortable home and uh, proliferate there. Because Helicobacter pylori, it is uh, just uh, the very uh, different uh, strains that are viciously malicious and, and uh, there are just uh, the neutral strains. Uh, what, uh, what would be just uh, the cause of prima? What is first? And that damages uh, yeah. just uh, the balance. Okay, yeah, <clears throat> that's a very interesting question. And I just recently participated for the first time because this is not, not my, my primary topic of research. I participated in the Helicobacter conference in Rome, maybe you were there too, but I learned that really there are different strains with very different... Uh, infectivity and pathogenicity. And, and I think now most people agree that the infection is acquired during the childhood. So there is no question about that. So it can, can <clears throat> it's in a way it's linked with hygiene. So when, and some people said even that when refrigerators became common, then helico started to decrease. So it mother probably by handling infects the, the uh, the child. And we have noticed that when we test in our lab, we test these people. So it's very often so that the whole family has, if the mother and, and father has, all the children have. So it really is an infective, uh, as we know, pathogen. And this bacteria, of course, the first step is that it causes acute, like any other bacteria. Histologically, you see a superficial infection, which is occupied by neutrophils, like any other bacteria. And if you don't read it, then the next step is that it remains chronic, and then the situation changes completely, like any chronic infection. Lymphocytes come instead of neutrophils. And what I learned also is that, or maybe this is still a speculation, but it's that when you get the first infection, then there happens something in, in the stomach mucosa and there was some, somebody mentioned that it, what might happen is that the first step, you can even lose, the stomach can become unacidic, which allows the bacteria to penetrate into the epithelial cells. And when it stabilizes the condition, then the acid output comes again, normal range. Because the whole issue with helico is that it, can resist the acidic environment of the stomach. There are very few other bacteria which has this capacity because normal, normal stomach with normal acid is sterile. It's a sterile, sterile environment, but the helico is the exception, so it can, can resist the acid output. And 
if you think what helico can do, it can both increase or decrease acidity, but the decrease is mostly seen in the first stage of the infection. So this is best I know. And of course, there are, is now much, much information also about the receptors of the bacteria at the cellular level. So that was very, very useful and interesting conference to see how much more they have learned really. And there are a lot of groups who are interested in helicobacter research, which was a big surprise to me. So.